Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Citrus Research Exchange, which today is being held in collaboration with the I for Energy seminar series. I'm Carl Brown, Deputy Director of the California Institute for Energy and Environment and part of the I for Energy professional staff. I'm standing in for my, my colleague, Therese, today. I'd like to uh, welcome you as well as the uh, webcast viewers at our Citrus campuses of Merced, Davis, and Santa Cruz, as well as uh, all the other webcast viewers out there. Uh, I will say that uh, today here in Berkeley, I've experienced um, some precipitation. I'm not sure it rises to the level of rain yet, uh, but it's it's a good day in Berkeley, and I'm I'm hope I'm wishing uh, the other drought affected areas are having the same same luck today. Uh, a little housekeeping note for those of you who pre-registered for the lunch and are enjoying that. Uh, everything about that meal uh, should be. Uh, uh, all the accompaniments to that meal should be put in the compost bins. It's all compostable except for the foil. Uh, a program note uh, on February 18th uh, at 10.30 a.m., uh, speaker Jeron Lanier. And with that, I'll get to uh, today's program, and we are... Uh, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Severin Bornstein, the E.T. Grether Professor of Business Administration and Public Policy at the Haas School of Business and co-director of the Energy Institute at Haas. He's also director of the University of California Energy Institute. Severin's research focuses on business competition, strategy, and regulation. He's published extensively on the airline industry, the oil and gasoline industries, and electricity markets. His current research projects include the economics of renewable energy, economic policies for reducing greenhouse gases, alternative models of retail electricity pricing, and competitive dynamics in the airline industry. Uh, he's going to talk with us today about the question, does rebound offset the savings from energy efficiency? So would you join me in welcoming Dr. Bornstein? Thank you, uh, people in the room and uh, out in the Internet. Uh, so everybody here is familiar with energy efficiency, or you probably haven't, aren't, aren't going to be interested in this talk generally. Um, it is, of course, the other renewable resource obtaining the same energy services using less energy, such as improving fuel economy, improving building insulation, appliance energy use, and uh, so forth. A lot of this is a good investment, it's argued, even without externalities considered. But there's this active debate about how large those savings are and how they change behavior. Part of that debate is this change in behavior, this ongoing debate about what's called rebound. And it's also called take back, this idea of increased use of energy when you use it more efficiently. Rebound is often divided into these two concepts of what are called direct rebound, uh, using the, which is generally, and I'm going to generalize here because surveying the literature, these terms are not used consistently, but usually it means once you make a good more energy efficient, people tend to use that good more often because per usage, it doesn't cost as much. So if you make a car more fuel efficient, people will use the car more because they will drive further because each mile they drive doesn't cost as much. Or they will run more loads of laundry because the, the uh, washer doesn't use as much electricity. And then there's, there's what's called the indirect rebound, and here's where term, terminology seems to go out the window, but usually it has something to do with gaining wealth from improved energy efficiency and spending that on something else that uses energy. It's often called the respending effect. Uh, there are other effects which I'm going to talk about, and some of them actually fall under the framework I'm going to present, and some of them don't. Uh, there's the original, going back to Jevons, the uh, first person who probably wrote about energy uh, rebound, there's the idea of innovation and how it, uh, innovation 
uh, as a result of energy efficiency improvements changes usage. There are, there are impacts on the price of energy, which I will talk about, and then there are broader macroeconomic impacts. So, as I said, Jevons basically started this discussion with a book in 1865 about the steam engine, arguing that making steam engines more efficient actually increased their use and raised the total use of coal at that time. Um, this, art, this basic argument has a lot of stuff folded into it beyond just the energy efficiency because it turned out when they became a, a fit more efficient, a lot of things happened to steam engines. And it's a great example both of rebound and of confusion about what is rebound. The argument was revived in a pretty uh, controversial way in 2010 when Owen published an article in The New Yorker uh, asserting that rebound is everywhere and that rebound is so large it eats up more than 100% of energy efficiency gain. So when you make something more efficient, behavior changes in such a way that actually people end up using more energy. That's known as backfire. Uh, the best thing about that article is this great cartoon, which I've stolen for this talk, um, and I mean that in both senses that that's the best thing. Uh, so there are a lot of different views on rebound. Uh, many researchers have found very small levels of rebound. Um, and Owen and others argue, and I will agree with them, that they are looking far too narrowly. They're just looking at direct rebound, that is, people using that particular appliance more when it becomes more energy efficient. Um, Owen, however, and Jevons, and the people who have generally argued for... Uh, for backfire, including the Breakthrough Institute study that came out a couple of years ago, um, attribute nearly everything to rebound. In fact, uh, Owen's article essentially says that there's been a whole lot of economic growth over the last 200 years, and at the same time we've gotten a lot more energy efficient, so all that economic growth must be attributed to energy efficiency, so our growth in energy use is a result of and this is a great example for a statistics class of confusing correlation and causality, uh, is a result of improvements of energy efficiency. And boy, if you look at that, we've, it's massive backfire. And that's clearly not right. Um, uh, so we, I, what I set out to do is read up on this and figure out, well, you know, how big could this effect be? And as I read up on it, I found that it pretty frustrating that, in fact, I didn't think the literature really had a good way of thinking about this. So in this paper, I try to lay that out. Before I go further, though, I think it's important to remember that nobody really cares about energy efficiency. That is, that is almost never the goal of any policy intervention. That is to actually make our use of energy more efficient. Sometimes it's to reduce pollution. Now, that is correlated with improving energy efficiency, but it's certainly not the same thing. Sometimes it's to enhance energy security. That's probably only interesting if you're actually improving oil efficiency, not energy efficiency broadly. Sometimes it's to relieve bottlenecks or capacity shortages. That's usually only interesting if the energy efficiency is in a specific location. And, some, and so generally, we're not talking specifically about energy efficiency being the goal. And when we do, we're generally confused, or we're confusing energy efficiency with whatever the original goal is. Sometimes it's a pretty darn good proxy, and that's fine. But certainly, if, we ha if all of our electricity came from renewable sources, from zero uh, greenhouse gas sources, improving energy efficiency would not be a way to reduce greenhouse gases. And so it's imp important to think about what is the actual impact on whatever our, whatever our true goal is so we end up actually doing efficient analysis or appropriate analysis of how effective it's been. I mean, the main, point, the main time this comes up, and it actually just came up in the New York Times Sunday, when somebody argued that we should be doing renewable energy in order to reduce our dependence on foreign sources. And, uh, you know, wind power just isn't substituting for anything that reduces our dependence on foreign energy. In general, it's important to remember what the connections are. 
a large part of this is to a large part of the interventions are argued to be important because they actually encourage consumption that is privately beneficial. Even setting aside all these social goals, it's argued that for various reasons people make bad decisions, private decisions. In some cases they just don't have the information or don't process it well, and so they make they buy the less energy efficient good, even though the more energy efficient good would actually save them privately money. In other cases, there are market barriers such as a landlord-tenant problem where the person making the purchase decision isn't the person paying the energy bill. And those are clearly there, and there's lots of arguments, I think, for government intervention in markets that don't produce efficient outcomes because of these sorts of, uh, these sorts of information failures. And we do it, by the way, everywhere in the economy. When you walk down the aisle in the supermarket, that can of beans you pull off Somebody has actually inspected the factory uh, for health and safety issues. And you probably want them to do that. You probably don't want to look at the shelf and say, now, which was the can that has botulism and which doesn't? You want the government to just set a standard on that. And so there, I think this is a perfectly uh, 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 supportable argument for government intervention. What I do in the paper, which, as on the first slide I showed, is available online, is develop a model, which I'm not going to walk through today, but I will give you the overview of, that tries to take the energy efficiency discussion and map it to the basic economics that it originally is founded on. That is, people change behavior. Well, economists have modeled how people make purchase decisions, and that model is actually pretty useful in thinking about energy efficiency rebound. So this is a very simple model. I won't go through all the details, but basically the idea is you got some appliance or you're about to buy some appliance. You can pay a little bit extra up front and get a more energy efficient version of it, and you get that for the life of the appliance. And so essentially it's just that sort of payoff. And if you do, of course, the once you buy the appliance, the marginal cost of using it goes down because now it's more energy efficient, but you've made a payment up front. If overall the savings are positive, then you're also richer, so there's more money to spend on other stuff, and that other stuff um, also uh, uses energy. And so I implement that model and examine the impact on consumption, uh, both if the energy efficiency investment is cost effective and if it's not. Okay, and I'm going to just show you there's a bunch of math, um, and I'm going to get to the equation, which I'm not going to explain, but I'm going to tell you there are five terms in it, and I'll tell you what the five terms are. First of all, the first term is simply the energy efficiency, direct or what I call static energy efficiency improvement. It says there's some embodied energy in the upgrade, and then there's some energy savings when you use the good if you didn't change your use of the good at all. So that's why it's called the static energy efficiency improvement. The second term is actually the term that reflects, boy, you saved money, or if you saved money, you then spend that on other stuff, and when you spend that on other stuff, that other stuff uses energy. Actually, in economic terms, it's not just other stuff that has what's called in economics an income effect. It's also the good itself. You might buy more of this good, not just because it's cheaper, but because you are now richer. So there's an income effect in economic terms that applies to both other goods and the good itself. And that's what the second and third term are. The fourth term is what is generally called direct rebound. It is saying if the price of using the good changes, I'm going to use it differently. If the price of driving goes down, I'm going to drive more. And that's, sort of, that's just the standard direct rebound effect. The fifth term, the last term, is one that is almost never discussed in energy efficiency literature. And it's this. Once you sort out this income effect, this change in how wealthy you are, and set that aside, if you're going to, let's say that's zero. Let's say that the amount it costs you to buy the upgrade exactly ma match the amount you would save if you didn't use the good anymore. So you've zeroed out the, the income effect. If you use the good more now that it's cheaper to use, the way you have to pay for that is using something else less. That is, though there is direct rebound, you do use the good more when it gets cheaper. 
we also have to account for the fact that you do something else less, and that saves energy. And that term, that last term, is almost always ignored in the literature. Uh, so what the model does is it actually breaks this out rigorously and says we can think of these as distinct effects, and when we think of these as distinct effects, it has some important implications. So let me go through those implications. Um, the first one I just pointed out, income effect rebound, which is this effect of getting richer, or not, by the way, if you make a bad decision, or let's say you just value the environment, so you spend so much on having a more efficient appliance that you actually are going to lose money over the life of it. If you are going to save money, then you're going to have more money to spend. You're going to spend it on something else, and that's going to use energy. If you lose money, then you're going to have less money to spend. You're going to buy fewer stuff, and that's going to also save energy. That's going to be an additional effect. That has nothing to do with the cross-elasticity or... or um, a substitution effect. That has nothing to do with the marginal price changing. That just has to do with saving, being richer or not being richer. Um, those are almost always confused in the literature. Um, and even if there's no income effect, even if you've zeroed that income effect out, you still have to account for this cross-elasticity. The fact that if you use this good more, you got to use some good le other good less. Um, aggregate income effect is almost certainly positive. If the net savings from there are net savings from energy efficiency, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's easy to come up with an example where there aren't, where somebody has just as a good Samaritan, as somebody who wants to help the Earth, is paying for an energy efficiency upgrade, even though privately to them it's never going to pay off. In which case they're actually poorer, and there is, this income effect is actually negative. It, it uh, causes a reduction in energy. Um, there's another reason, well, there are two other reasons. One I'll mention right now, which is people just may be bad at math. Some people may make an investment that never pays off. And if you've had an energy audit on your house, the energy auditor has told you some good things to do. But if they are in this business, it's quite likely they've also pointed out some other things you could do that have a payback period of 90 years. Um, and in other words, they're negative net present value, and if you do them, you are going to be poorer. You might do them anyway. Uh, you might do them because you want to do them. You might do them because uh, you feel like it's the right thing to do. Third implication is that net direct rebound is almost always going to be smaller than direct rebound. That is, when people talk about direct rebound, this idea of using a good more when it gets le less costly to use it, they almost always ignore the fact that you've got to use something else less in order to use this more and still meet your balanced budget. Uh, and so by ignoring that, we're overstating the level of rebound. And lastly, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, total rebound can be negative. Uh, and this isn't a new finding. Other people have pointed this out. Uh, there are lots of ways you can get to that. One is um, if, the income, if there's no substitution effect, that is you don't use it anymore when it gets cheaper or almost anymore at all, but it's a negative income effect. That is you've made an investment that's never going to pay off. Then rebound is actually going to be negative. The total savings is going to be larger than the static energy efficiency savings. Um, and I go through some other examples that where you also have uh, negative rebound. Okay, what a, so I then take this framework and I start and I use it to point out a couple of other places where I think the literature has really missed important effects on energy efficiency rebound that are gonna that should be incorporated and if so will really change the way we think about it. And the first one is when price deviates from marginal cost. Um, so. Your utility is selling you natural gas at $10 per million BTU. But that's not their marginal cost. Their marginal cost is $7 per, or $6, let's say, per million BTU. Now, if you use one less million BTU, you save $10. But society doesn't save $10. Society only saves $6 because the marginal cost of saving that, of using that gas was only $6. They were charging you a price above marginal cost. 
So while you are $10 richer, that's not the only income effect going on. Somebody else is $4 poorer because you just stopped paying $10 and they only saved $6. Now that may be shareholders if they're required to cover that, but it's probably not. It's probably other ratepayers because eventually ratepayers end up covering this cost. So when we think about income effect rebound, if the good is priced above marginal cost, if all we do is focus on the savings to the customer at the retail price, and that retail price differs from marginal cost, we're going to, if the retail price is well above marginal cost, we're going to overstate income effect rebound because we're going to have the, we're going to look at the that person's income effect rebound and ignore the negative impact it's having on everybody else. This turns out to be incredibly important in a couple of settings. One is in the United States, it turns out to be incredibly important in utility pricing, actually around the world, because almost every utility prices uh, both natural gas and electricity well above marginal cost. Uh, Lucas Davis and I have a paper. We estimate the gap is typically 30 to 40 percent above uh, true marginal cost. It makes it quite likely that a lot of energy efficiency investments actually have a negative income effect. Because while I may save money making my house more energy efficient, if I'm saving money calculated at the retail rate, Society is losing some amount every time I use less gas, uh, the rest of society, and I'm not taking that into account. So even if it's income positive for me, it's quite possible it's income negative for society as a whole. If we then think about income effect rebound, if it's income negative for society as a whole, it's probably actually got a negative income re effect rebound, and we have to account for that. And in the past, we really haven't done that. Um, In Europe, particularly also in the United States, but particularly in Europe, transportation fuel is priced way, way above marginal cost. And as a result, when you do something to improve energy efficiency, it is true that by buying a more fuel-efficient car, it's true that there may, there's likely to be an income effect for you because you just saved money by having to spend less on gas, even for the same behavior. There's going to be a negative income effect for the government because their tax revenues just went down. And that's going to show up somewhere. Either the government's going to do less stuff, which that less stuff uses means they use less energy, or they're going to raise taxes on other people to offset it, meaning those people can't buy as much, and that's going to use less energy. So again, even on transportation fuel prices, generally well above marginal cost in the developed world, in the developing world, of course, you get the opposite effect. In many, particularly oil-producing countries, price is well below marginal cost. And when price is well below marginal cost, uh, the, there is a positive spillover. Uh, we had the, econ the chief economist of Saudi Aramco at the Energy Institute a few years ago, and he pointed out that we make money every time people don't use gasoline in Saudi Arabia because we're selling it at so far below the true opportunity cost. That is, they are selling gasoline for 50 cents a gallon. When somebody in Saudi Arabia doesn't use a gallon of gasoline, they get to sell it on the international market and make a whole lot more money. So there's a positive income effect to other players in the market when you are more energy efficient if it's priced below marginal cost. All of that has ignored the negative externalities associated with energy efficiency or with energy use. And in the paper, I talk about this. This is actually a much more complex analysis because the negative externality is not a monetary externality. It is actually, a, in a sense, a consumption externality. You are forcing other people to consume more greenhouse gases and all the effects that has in the world. And as I discuss in the paper in some detail, it will depend on whether that force change in consumption is complementary or a substitute for other energy use. And I go through some examples of how, think about a local pollutant. If there's, if, if there's a local pollution, a local pollution effect, if that changes, then it's going to change people's interest in going outside and driving and all sorts of things. 
I then use the model to talk about a behavioral aspect of rebound, and that is this idea. Remember, a lot of this comes about from wanting to address the energy efficiency gap, and the idea is there is a gap, meaning people are failing to take advantage of things that are privately profitable, that for some reason, and some people say it's myopia, they don't sort of properly weight future savings against current uh, expenses. Some people say it's uh, confusion about the source of energy. I suspect both of those are going on to some extent. But those have implications also when we talk about rebound. Um, so, And what they do generally, in my opinion, is they reduce the prospects for rebound. So think about the principal agent problem, in, uh, the landlord-tenant problem. Let's say we pass a regulation that says the landlord has to install an energy-efficient refrigerator. If, we're, if that's correcting the problem that the landlord was previously installing too, too low an efficiency refrigerator because they weren't the one who had to pay the electricity bills, it's pretty implausible that that's, the landlord's going to say, well, since I'm buying a more energy-efficient refrigerator, I'm going to buy a bigger refrigerator for my tenants which is the way you'd see rebound in refrigerators. That is, because it's not a single optimizing agent making this decision, if we correct it, the sort of rebound you would expect to see is not likely to occur uh, if you already had this separation. <clears throat> more generally, or more broadly, um, think about the standard car fuel efficiency problem. And this, I think the research, by the way, is not very supportive that people undervalue fuel efficiency. Um, if anything, it's about neutral from the best research out there. But let's say it, it, there is a problem. Let's say that people don't buy a fuel efficient, a sufficiently fuel efficient car because they just aren't taking into account the future savings of gasoline versus the current cost. And, you know, they're the sort of people who don't really pay much attention to how much gasoline costs. They just fill up the tank. Well, if they're the sort of people who don't really pay much attention to fuel, how much gasoline costs and just fill up the tank, when gasoline costs less because they have a more energy-efficient car, they're not the sort of people who, in general, are going to then drive more because they weren't paying attention before and they're probably still not paying attention. So if we're starting this discussion from an energy efficiency gap argument, then I think we have to recognize that undermines a lot of the arguments for rebound. Likewise, um, a lot that where there's probably more evidence of, re, of um, a, an energy efficiency gap in home lighting, if people just aren't aware of how much electricity lighting uses, so they leave the lights on all the time, or they just don't, that, they don't really ration their use based on how much it costs, if it suddenly costs a lot less, those people are unlikely to say, well, suddenly now there are perfect optimizers and you say, now that it costs less, I'm going to leave my lights on all the time. Uh, now, how big is this effect? We don't know, but I think there is a real tension between this idea of an energy efficiency gap, and yet once we correct it, there's going to be a um, fully optimizing rebound. In contrast, if you don't think there's an energy efficiency gap, if you think consumers really optimize well, then when you impose one of these regulations it's likely to have a negative income effect. Why? Because these people were already optimizing really well. They were already doing exactly the right trade-off. To the extent that this new regulation binds, it's actually forcing people to do something that's costing them. And to the extent that's true, that's likely to have a negative income effect and reduce uh, energy efficiency rebound. Uh, and there's a discussion of the more subtle issue of what if the what if the regulations actually are not about just straight dollar savings, but change the attributes of the firm of the product, and that's a little more complicated. Um, I'm going to move along pretty quickly because I want to get to some calculations, uh, but I quickly want to address. There's often a discussion about how rebound is limited because people have limited time to consume more. Um, and uh, it turns out that that's what's in the demand curve already. So if we're doing the calculation right, there's nothing unusual about that. I just got a warning that we're 10 minutes, so I will move along. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to move through that. So Jevons and Owen and a lot of these backfire guys talk about technological change. Uh, it increases income and energy use, and that's true. And that's true of all technological change, whether it's about energy efficiency or anything else. Getting richer uses more energy. Um, energy efficiency R&D uh, may be, have a bigger problem because it creates energy-biased technological change. That is that people start, when people change the energy efficiency of a good, they then start inventing around that good to use it more. And Jevons' example of the steam engine was the perfect example. Making it smaller and more efficient allowed it to be used in transportation. So because the steam engine became more efficient, or the engine became more efficient, it could now be used as part of a railroad. And that caused a huge in, uh, in expansion of income and um, also a big substitution effect from other things. It is important that when we do that calculation, it's not enough just to say we use that more, but we use something else less. And it's going to be important to net out whatever we were doing less of when we started using steam engines more. Um, okay. Uh, I'll spend one minute. There is this broader uh, idea of endogenous energy prices, that if you use less oil, the price of oil will fall, and that will cause somebody else to use more oil. Uh, and that's another form of rebound. It's often called price effect rebound or macroeconomic price effect rebound. Um, that actually, I do some quick calculations on that, and I'll show you in a minute, and that actually is potentially large with oil. It's probably not a big effect with coal and natural gas. Um, and then there's a macroeconomic multiplier effect, which I'm not going to talk about because I'm going to run out of time, but I think is also an important uh, area for future research that we know very little about. I do some back-of-the-envelope calculations on the potential for oil price effect rebound, depending on how much, how inelastic you think the supply of oil is. And we get some, I get some pretty big numbers here. Um, I think a bare minimum number for oil energy efficiency is 17%, and that's really using a huge supply elasticity and very inelastic demand, and it can get be as much as 50%. Um, so I think... It really is true that when we use less oil, it does tend to drive down the price of oil, and that does tend to make it more attractive for other people to use oil. I think that that's an argument for why we need to think about how to get, which I think is a general failing in our thinking about climate change, is how to get the whole world to use more energy-efficient goods, not just how to get California's uh, this fetish for reducing California's uh, greenhouse gas footprint, I think, has really gotten out of control. Um, okay, so let me say a couple things about measurement before I stop. The last part of the paper says, okay, what can we actually do with the, this framework? And the first thing it does is it goes through and does just direct calculations of how much energy you're saving and how many dollars you're saving when you save a gallon of gasoline, save a kilowatt hour of electricity, save a MMBTU of natural gas, and how big is the income effect rebound associated with that? So what I do is I say, let's say you consume a dollar less, uh, a gallon less of gasoline. Let's remember that it's not the retail price that matters, but the marginal cost, because that's what society as a whole is really saving. Uh, and let's say when some, when that gets respent, how much energy, how much of this income effect energy efficiency rebound do you get? I take, do those calculations, and then I say, let's just assume for this quick calculation that you spend it on goods that have the average energy intensity of the society as a whole. And there are people who argue, no, the marginal energy intensity of expenditures is less. There are people who seem to have this obsession with travel to exotic locations and always give the example of if you save money, you're going to use it to fly to uh, distant places. Um, there's no evidence that money is money, so I don't think there's any real evidence that people are going to spend it in any particular way. But income effect rebound alone, just on spending on the average energy efficiency, for gasoline is about 14%, for electricity is about 6%, for natural gas is about 3%. Natural gas turns out you're saving a lot of energy for every dollar, so that when you respend it, you're not you, you're not uh, uh, using that much uh, energy. That is, natural gas per dollar, at least right now, has a much higher energy intensity per dollar. 
Um, now, of course, here's where it becomes clear that we don't really care about energy efficiency. We care about greenhouse gases in this probably or other pollutants. And so translating that to what we really care about is going to be important. Um, I go through a discussion in the paper and talk about the, what do we do about the embodied energy and the upgrade. That turns out to be neutral to this calculation because although, yes, it takes energy, it also takes dollars. If it's got the energy intensity of the average expenditure, counting the energy in the upgrade exactly is offset by the fewer dollars. And so the, it only changes the calculation to the extent that the upgrade has a different energy intensity than what you otherwise would have spent the money on. Um, okay, so it's just a reminder that we need to think about long-run substitution and uh, income effects. So then I do a couple of calculations at the end. The first is for cars. What if we doubled um, automobile fuel economy? So let me say what this does include and what it doesn't include. This does include the income effect that we talked about in the original equation. It includes the net income effect, taking into account the difference between the retail price and the true long-run marginal cost. It has an estimate of the substitution effect and includes this net substitution effect. That is the fact that when you consume more of this, you've got to consume less of something else. What it doesn't include is this macroeconomic effect, this, this energy price effect. So to the extent it's driving down oil prices, that's not in here. So looking at doubling fuel economy, I try to take a basic uh, a car that is about where CAFE standards were and where they're going to um, and apply these calculations, making an assumption about discount rates, about other marginal costs of driving, retail price, uh, long-run marginal cost. What I find is an income effect of about 11% uh, that's slightly different than that gasoline number because there are other costs, it turns out, to driving your car more miles. And a substitution effect that depends on how much more you're going to drive. Uh, the best estimate out there is minus 0.02 for VMT. Uh, if that's right, then you get an income effect about 11%, a substitution effect about 13%. Those are additive or approximately additive. So you get a rebound of about 24%. I then do this for lighting. I'm embarrassed, actually, to have CFLs up here. They are basically a dead technology, as I can, far as I can tell. Um, I think the more interesting thing is LEDs. Uh, but uh, I, when I wrote this a year and a half ago, I think it was not as clear that, C that LEDs were just going to plummet in price. Um, but I do the same sort of calculation here. Uh, here, the difference between the retail electricity price and the long-run marginal cost is really important. Um, because people are getting an income effect from saving retail, but that's not all a societal income effect because the utility is losing uh, money when you save electricity. We get a small income effect because lighting is mostly energy. So when you save on lighting, you save a lot of energy per dollar. When you respend that on just average goods in the society, you don't spend you don't soak up as much energy. So we get pretty small income effects. Now here's the big question. How big is the substitution effect? Well, there is a couple of guys who have done these studies, and one of them is called 700 Years of Lighting, um, that have talked about when lighting gets cheaper, how much more lighting do people use? And you know, I, these are wild ass guesses as far as I can tell, but they're making their best effort. Um, I think they don't take into account the hassle and safety factors of candles versus light bulbs and things like that. But the estimates I use are from the most recent decade, which aren't about candles. They're about different lighting types. And they come up with a substitution elasticity of minus 0.06. If you put those together, LEDs versus incandescents have a rebound of about 30%. Um, and I think these are ballparking numbers in plausible range. Um, I also have done these calculations for greenhouse gases, and the paper talks about what those, uh, what the assumptions are about where the marginal electricity is coming from. Um, and so, but I think it's important to do that because, of course, what we really care about is greenhouse gases or local pollutants, not about energy per se. Um, so. 
the stu- you, doing these back of the envelope calculations, which I point out are not the last word in this in any way, but I think are an important contribution into thinking about how do we do these calculations, and they give us ballparks in the 20 to 30, 35% uh, rebound. I think those are reasonable numbers. I think when we start talking about energy price effects in oil, they, get, they might get a lot larger to the extent the rest of the world is soaking up oil we don't consume. But I think that setting that aside, these are the right ballpark numbers. It's not zero, and it's not backfire. Um, and I think both cases um, are overstating their case. Lastly, I am an economist. I can't leave without pointing out rebound is economic value. Rebound is people re-optimizing in response to a change in relative prices. That's a good thing. We like rebound in that sense. We should be harnessing rebound to recognize that if that people rebound makes people better off, we can do something else, like a carbon tax, to offset that, and they're still as well off as before. Um, okay. Uh, rebound, energy efficiency is a $20 bill on the sidewalk. Rebound makes it a $25 bill. And there is this real question of how big that bill really is. Um, we haven't done a great job of energy efficiency evaluation um, through real rigorous studies, and I think that's an area we need to do a lot more of. So careful dissection of energy efficiency rebound helps clarify the causes and the analysis. I think this substitution income effect helps point out a number of things that have been ignored in previous energy efficiency rebound studies um, and can be applied to, for, to any situation. It's sort of a framework for how do I think about rebound. Um, it also clarifies a lot of these uh, measurement issues and what really has to be included. Um, economy-wide rebound, that is the macro effect and the energy price effect, really need a lot more work. And lastly, rebound is value creation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Severin. Uh, let's take questions. Yeah, if I thank you. If I were trying to be a devil's advocate with regard to your point about the um, the obsession in California with the uh, climate footprint, uh, I might ask whether there's any evidence that a community that establishes a successful low climate footprint can exercise a demonstration or a proof of concept uh, or a role model effect on behavior in the rest of the world. Yeah, that, it's absolutely true. That's the pro argument. The con argument is that uh, we're doing lots of things that are idiosyncratic to California and really aren't exportable. And I'm completely with you. If we were to actually try to calculate those things or justify them as, look, let's question whether California should just have a let's reduce our greenhouse gas footprint policy and think about should California instead just be investing in technologies that are exportable to the developing world, or at least every policy should be asking, is this really worth doing? Is this really something China and India will adopt? Because if it isn't, then I think we're just sort of patting ourselves on the back and not really making progress. But I have to say that's a completely separate topic. I just threw that line in. Yeah. To what extent can you do these calculations a little simpler by doing long-run price or budget constraint elasticities of people's electricity consumption vis-a-vis -vis prices and electricity bills? With the, idea that, sure with the idea that if efficiency is changing the price of the service, then the rebound response would be similar to... Uh, price response, oh. because really they're responding to the price of the service. So if the long-run elasticity of their electricity price is 0.2 or 0.3, why wouldn't the rebound basically be 20 to 30 percent? That's exactly what I've, that's exactly the calculation I've done here. I've actually, I, I should have mentioned, I sort of took a shortcut and said, I'm going to assume that people treat the cost of this going down as they would treat the cost of it going down if the fuel price actually dropped instead or if anything else changed. My point is that's not enough. Once you do that, you still have to calculate the income effect rebound. You still have to calculate this net substitution and recognize that if they consume more of this, they've got to consume less of something else. 
And if you're not netting that out, then you're overstating the di- what's called direct rebound. When I sought to replace the windows in my aging home, I knew that it was a very long-term investment that I was unlikely to see economic value from over the expected life of my ownership. But there was also a tremendous increase in quality of life from both warmth and reduced sound transmission. Where do those quality of life factors come into the formula? Well, they don't. And in fact, you'd have to, here's where, here's the only place they would come in. They would, I mean, in a sense, good for you. That's a great thing, and it's another plus and another reason to do energy efficiency. Does it cause rebound, or does it change the amount of rebound? And the question is, is that comfort a complement or a substitute to other energy, effic- energy use? So let me give you an example. I insulated my house. It's really warm now and cozy. I hate going out on cold nights. I just stay home. I don't drive my car. I don't do so. As a result, I'm even more energy efficient. Of course, you can tell the opposite story. I play. I watch my 90-inch television. Turn all my computers on. Whatever. And so that, uh, that that's a compliment in that case. So uh, you know, those. That's the way you would do the calculation. Um, and I didn't even attempt that here. <laughs> But it's funny because my, my comment or question is almost like Brian's because I – do I recall that there was a period in car efficiency – sorry, automobile efficiency? And your slide on that reminded me that um, even though we were making cars ostensibly more energy efficient, there were no regulations. And so Toyota and others just loaded up the vehicles with you know, running boards, better seats, uh, bigger wheels to make everything look more consumer um, attractive, and so any any work that was done on the engines and transmission was counterbalanced by uh, a lot of bells and whistles added for consumer uh, charm. Was it, is that right? Is, I think that sure. did happen. I yeah. mean, for a long time, they, I mean, the, it, it is it, there. There are certainly, and Chris Canetel has a great paper on this, looking at where b- improved efficiency got spent. And a lot of it got spent on better acceleration. That is, once we knew how to run a given engine more efficiently, we gave you a bigger engine that could still get the same fuel economy. Well, in that case, we're not getting the energy efficiency savings. We're getting the pleasure of fast starts. Now, and then we're back to this question, is that a complement to using energy or substitute? If it's now really fun to drive, that could actually cause people to use more energy. Uh, but in general, we have to think about to the extent this stuff is associated with attribute changes, and I didn't go there in this paper. I had enough to tackle here. But to the extent it's associated with attribute changes, you're going to have to think about how those attributes are uh, associated with rebound. Okay. We have a question back here. Question back. Hi. Um, a clarifying question and a question. So clarifying, this is primarily for residential individuals. This isn't a commercial industrial um, and whether it be a change, I'll just throw out the other question. This is the well. Let me just say, yes, it's for residential. There's a paragraph saying you can do a similar thing for uh, commercial industrial. I haven't done that yet. Mm-hmm. I, you know, this was to basically lay out the first framework of this. Okay. And then the the dumb engineers question for the economist. When you talked about the marginal cost, you said marginal cost to the utility, the provider, but there's the whole supply chain. There's someone who provided. Uh, you know, pay, you know, the utility, is there income loss throughout that supply chain? Why is that income loss not just fully balanced out? So the long-run marginal cost to the utility, if all markets were competitive, would account for everybody upstream from the utility they had to pay because those are costs to the utility. If all those prices reflected the true marginal cost to each of those upstream suppliers, to the extent there are margins in that, then those people are also poorer Now, if they're really competitive markets, there aren't much in the way of margins. They're just about breaking even. But to the extent that there are margins, uh, then then that's there as well. My guess is that's a pretty small effect in utilities. Most of their cost is energy. Energy markets are pretty darn competitive. And so the the marginal price probably reflects marginal cost pretty closely. If you ask, what does it really cost society for a utility to give you an extra MMBTU? Uh, it's probably pretty close to the cost of an MMBTU. Uh, but, but, yeah, in any vertical chain, we'd want to know where all those rents, economic rents are, and recognize that those people upstream are being made poor. Yeah. 
I'm not, not an economist, but uh, I look at sort of the cognition of climate change. And one of the things that I understand from economics is that uh, the discounting function matters a lot. Uh, and that that would probably interact with uh, individual uh, thoughts. So, for instance, right now it's unfortunately a bit controversial as to whether or not climate change is happening, uh, what the greenhouse gases are doing, but you might imagine that at some point in the future everyone will be on board and it will become part of your social uh, um, responsibility to swallow up these potential rebound effects and therefore if you don't want your children to not have fish from the sea anymore or to uh, perhaps not uh, not enjoy the biodiversity that includes food and so forth, that you'll be willing to suck these things up. So doesn't that change the discounting function such that uh, as the, the population becomes more accepting and it becomes more obvious that climate is changing, that the economics will perhaps drastically change? It will change. Um, I'm not sure. It doesn't change the analysis. It means you would do the analysis with a different discount rate. I am, by the way, way less optimistic than you are that we're ever going to get to voluntary uh, change of that sort. And the example I just have to point out, since it's one of my hobby horses, is what's been happening with Spare the Air Days in the Bay Area, that uh, there are plenty of liberal political neighbors of mine who think that this stuff about not having a wood fire is just crazy. I mean, what? how could a wood fire hurt you? Uh, and... I think people can go a long ways towards justifying their behavior. Until we actually have economic incentives, uh, I don't think we're going to see a big change in behavior. Now, when we do have those economic incentives, then prices can be well above marginal cost again, and we're gonna, people are going to save money, uh, and they're going to be more negative income effect uh, energy efficiency, as, I've, as the model uh, presents it, and that potentially has negative rebound. Uh, thank you, everyone, for all the great questions. We're going to end the session now. Um, I want to come to Severin's house to watch Davis Cup. Or, <laughs> or, or maybe he's watching the Super Bowl instead. I'm not sure. But uh, please give me a, uh, help me give Severin a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. The paper is available online, and if you want the slides instead, though I will encourage you to read the paper, uh, I will send you the slides. Just email me. If you Google Severin Bornstein, I'm the only one. Mm -hmm.